So I'm introducing Chris Kasma tonight. He's a PhD candidate in, uh, at the University of Riverside, and he's going to be speaking to us about all of his research, uh, how climate change is in affecting moths and other interactions in California. And he has something really cool to tell about Griffith Park. Maybe not so cool, actually. But... <laughs> My name is Chris Cosma. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Riverside. And today I'm going to be talking about prioritizing California native plants for butterfly and moth conservation. All right, so thanks for having me here. It's great to be here. We live like an hour away, but I, I confess that I've never been to this area. and It looks very nice. I hope to explore it more someday. Um, so most of my research actually focuses on how climate change is affecting moth pollination. Um, and so I'm going to be talking a lot about moths today, but what I really want to do throughout this talk is paint a picture of moths, not as these pests that we know from eating our clothes or invading our pantries or flying around our heads at night, but instead as important components of our ecosystems, as important pollinators and as critical components of food webs. But before I bore you about moths, I'm gonna actually visit a species that I, I suspect everyone here is probably familiar with, and that is a monarch butterfly. And you may know that just last year, the monarch butterfly was officially listed by the IUCN as an endangered species. And part of the reason behind that listing is the Western population that overwinters here in California. Um, in 2020, the Western monarch Thanksgiving count recorded fewer than 2000 individuals for this population. And this was a really drastic decline in our local population here. It actually was an over 99% decline in the Western monarch population since around the 1980s. But like most charismatic species that are studied in ecology and conservation, the monarch is really a poster child for a much larger problem. So in the US alone, 48%, so almost half of the species that have been assessed um, are in decline. And that's especially apparent here in the Southwest and other parts of the Intermountain West. So this heat map here is by, uh, from a study by Crossley et al 2020, um, where the warmer colors here are actually the areas where they're seeing the highest rates of population decline in butterflies. And you can see that a large portion of California and other parts of the, uh, the Southwest are particularly affected here. So here in the Western US, some studies by Forrester et al have found that Butterfly abundance has declined by about 1.6% per year in the, uh, in the Western US over the last four decades. And really critically, dozens of Western US species are even more at risk uh, than the monarch, including very widespread species like the West Coast Lady, a, a very common, very widespread butterfly that is, um, is also declining across California, even more so than the monarch butterfly. So here we are right at the edge of Griffith Park. And um, I told you I had had news about Griffith Park. Turns out that 18% of butterfly species in Griffith Park have gone locally extinct in the last century. So that doesn't mean that these butterflies are extinct um, globally or, or in, in California or in the US. But right here in this part of California, we haven't seen these 20% of butterfly species almost almost in the last hundred years here. All right, so taking a step back, there are around 240 butterfly species in California, and we know that their populations are declining. So I said I was gonna be talking about moths today. We have around 5,000 species of moths in California. So how are their populations doing? Well, the answer is we don't really know because unlike butterflies, no one's really done comprehensive studies of moth populations in the Western US. 
But we do have data from other parts of the world, including in Great Britain, where they found a 33% decline in moth abundance since 1968. So you can see this um, pretty drastic down downward trend here. So if I had to guess, I would say our Western US species are probably not doing so well either. All right, so butterflies and moths are declining. Why does that matter? Well, one of the reasons we care about declines in Lepidoptera is because they are the second most diverse group of insects. Um, there are over 14,000 Lepidoptera species in North America alone. And something that is often met with surprise is that 95% of these species are moths and not butterflies. So the vast majority of species diversity in the order Lepidoptera are moths. So this small highlighted section of our phylogeny here, which is just showing the evolutionary relatedness of these organisms um, is, is our small portion of butterflies. Everything else in this order are moths. So they're super diverse. Um, another reason we care about Lepidopter declines is because they are critical components of our food webs. So as caterpillars, moths and butterflies are herbivores, um, eating plants and taking in that plant energy. And then as caterpillars and also as adults, they serve as really important food sources for birds and bats and a lot of other animals. And it turns out that in these two roles as herbivores and as prey, Lepidoptera transfer more energy from plants to other animals than all other herbivores combined. So I really wanna emphasize this point here is that herbivory can be a really good thing. We often think of herbivory as you know, pests eating our garden, um, but the truth is that herbivory is really important in ecosystems. It fuels our terrestrial food webs. So let's um, kind of visit the structure of our ecosystems here. At the, the base of our food webs, we have our primary producers, which on land are plants. And the only way that that plant energy gets into higher levels of our food webs here, the primary consumers, um, is through the action of herbivory. So, uh, you know, caterpillars, other insects, and other herbivores taking in that plant energy, which is then um, transferred up the food chain to the higher level consumers. And so when you see evidence of herbivory, especially on native plants, um, you're potentially supporting a local food web there. So, you know, there's also the possibility that's a pest species, an invasive species that's eating, uh, that's eating your native plants as well. But a lot of times, a little amount of herbivory is a really good sign of a healthy ecosystem. And again, Lepidoptera do this energy transfer better than any group of organisms. Caterpillars can actually make up to 90% of the diet of some of our native songbirds. So they're really, really critical, especially for rearing baby birds. And then some bats are moth specialists and almost exclusively rely on moths in their diet. And so in light of these facts, it's really no surprise that Lepidopter declines have been linked to declines in our native songbirds and bats, including right here in the US. Um, a study by Doug Tallamy showed that insectivorous birds, so uh, birds that primarily rely on insects in their diet, have declined by 2.9 billion individuals over the last 50 years. Versus non-insectivorous birds, so birds that are primarily eating seeds and other food sources, have actually increased by 26.2 million individuals. So this is pretty compelling evidence that the loss of insects and particularly Lepidopter is very tightly linked to um, the decline in bird diversity and, and abundance that we're seeing across the US. All right, so another reason we care about Lepidopter is because they're important pollinators and butterflies get most of the attention here. We all know that butterflies are out there flying around, visiting our flowers during the day, transferring pollen. But it turns out that moths are actually probably even better at pollinating both our wild and agricultural plants. So there's a lot of mounting evidence showing that moths are very important and underappreciated pollinators. And so some examples of that, we have found that um, moths pollinate things like avocados and berries and apples. And I can't find much support for this in the literature, but I've filmed in my own backyard. Ooh, the video is not going to work. That's a shame. Well, 
I can't show you the video, but it's a video of a moth uh, visiting the citrus flowers right in my own backyard. So I'm pretty sure they're out there pollinating the citrus trees, which we live in Riverside, so we're famous for our, our citrus. All right, and we also know in California that moths are really important pollinators of many of our wild plants. And that includes the famous yucca yucca moth interaction. If you've ever gone through an ecology and evolution course in high school or college, you probably learned about this. Um, and then there's hawk moth pollination of uh, species in the genus Datura and evening primrose and also some of our agave species. And in a separate part of my research that I'm not going to talk about as much today, I go out into Southern California habitats and I collect moths and I look at the pollen that they're carrying on their bodies. And I've actually found that around 60% of moths in Southern California habitats are transporting pollen. And it's not just these big charismatic moths like the white line sphinx that many of you probably see flying around at dusk or dawn, but it's these boring gray brown moths that you probably don't even notice or pay attention to, um, or maybe they just fly around your lights at night. These moths are also out there pollinating um, our wild and our agricultural plants. All right, so Lepidopter are really important components of our ecosystems, I hope I've shown you here. Um, and so we want to protect these services that they supply to natural ecosystems as well as to us as humans. Um, and doing that requires an understanding of why Lepidopter have been so impacted by global change. And it's a difficult question to answer. David Wagner in 2021 described um, global threats to insects as death by a thousand cuts. And this is basically the idea that there are just so many threats being thrown at insects from all sides um, that oftentimes it's really hard to determine the single, the single leading cause behind, behind any decline. And more often than not, it's probably a combination of many interacting factors. And that includes everything from habitat loss to introduced species, invasive species, to pollution, including light pollution, which is really bad for nocturnal organisms like moths. We have pesticides in our agricultural fields, and even the pesticides that we use at our homes are affecting insects. And then, of course, we have the effects of climate change. Um, and the effects of climate change include things like increased wildfires to droughts and heat waves. Um, and even you know, the erratic precipitation events we've been having lately in California, these are all affecting insects. And so in conclusion here, just like bees, just like almost every group of insect right now, butterflies and moths are being affected by all of these different factors. Um, uh, one thing we know about Lepidopter, thanks to our friend the monarch butterfly, is that they rely very closely on native plant species. And so the monarch famously is what we call a host plant specialist. And that means that this species caterpillars can only develop on, uh, on milkweed plants. So species in the, the Sclepius genus. Yeah, the monarch butterfly is a host plant specialist. And again, what that means is that its caterpillars can only uh, rear on milkweed plants. Okay. And it turns out that specialist species are actually at greater risk of extinction under environmental change, including climate change, because they're more easily decoupled from, from their resources. And I'm going to go through what I mean by that here. Let's take the opposite end of the spectrum here and look at what we call an ecological generalist. And a generalist is just a species that can rely on many different uh, resources. In the case of host plants for caterpillars, that could mean many different plant species that that caterpillar can, can feed on. Now, the local extinction or loss of any one of these plant species is not likely to greatly affect that generalist because, of that, again, it has alternative partners that it can rely on. But if we take our ecological specialists like the monarch butterfly, that same plant species loss is likely to have a great negative effect on that species because again, it's the only plant that it can eat. And the monarch butterfly is not alone. 90% of plant eating insects are host plant specialists. 
And what that means overwhelmingly is that these species rely on native plants. And I really like this definition of native by Rick Dark and Doug Tallamy in the book, The Living Landscape. Getting a lot of, a lot of feedback here, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, so a, a plant or animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. And a part of this definition that I really like is its, its focus on the amount of time that it takes for these co-evolved relationships to, to uh, take place here. And these are millions of years of living alongside one another that these insects and these plants develop these very close relationships with one another. And that's the reason why a lot of times our native butterflies and moths cannot rely on introduced species that they've never encountered before. So again, uh, this puts the focus on this, the importance of host plant specialization and finding species and planting species like the milkweed to support them. But I want to emphasize a key point here is that Lepidoptera rely on native plant resources at every stage of their life cycle, not just as caterpillars. I'm going to go through the Lepidoptera life cycle here to demonstrate this. We have our eggs, which are deposited on, native, on the native host plant. We have, again, our caterpillars, which are often highly specialized on those host plants. Even things like the placement of chrysalis and cocoons benefits from diverse native plant resources. And then finally, we have our adults, which drink in, uh, flower nectar. And studies have shown that native plants are often more attractive to them and often more nourishing. So they provide greater nutritional content as well. And so looking at this life cycle here, it becomes very clear that Lepidoptera need both their native host plants and their native nectar plants. And again, host plants are those plants that are eaten by the larval Lepidoptera, the caterpillars, and nectar plants are the plants that are visited and often pollinated by adult Lepidoptera. And so it's no surprise that, oh, my slides are not, my slides are lagging a little bit up here. Um, Lepidoptera declines are driven by the loss of native hosts and nectar plants uh, due to things like habitat destruction and climate change and all those other stressors that I talked about earlier. All right, so that's a lot of bad news and I apologize the first part of this talk is a little bit depressing, but I wanna get into the good news, which is what we can do about it. So Lepidopter declining, but we know that part of the solution is planting native plants and the monarch butterfly has taught us this. Native plants support up to 15 times more native Lepidopter species than introduced in ornamental plants. Again, because of those co-evolved relationships that take millions of years to develop. And any yard or garden can be an important insect waste station. There's been studies showing that milkweed gardens on private lands, including people's gardens in their backyards, can contribute to effective monarch conservation. So everyone has a role to play. But I do believe that we can improve the way we plant native for insect conservation. I'm going to go through what I mean by that here. So the monarch butterfly is at risk, so we plant milkweed. But as the list of threatened or endangered Lepidoptera species grows larger and larger, the list of native plants that we need to support them also grows. And so effective Lepidoptera conservation means moving from this focus on individual species and interactions like the monarch milkweed relationship to considering entire communities of threatened Lepidoptera because entire communities of Lepidoptera are threatened. And one of the ways we can do that is by using what are called ecological networks. And ecological networks just are a way to visualize and analyze the relationships between entire communities of plants and the insects that rely on them. And through analyzing these networks, we can identify important species to conserve and also ones that are more vulnerable. And this may include our specialized insects like a monarch butterfly, but also maybe the plants in the community, those generalist plants that are supporting a lot of, a lot of different insects in the community. 
And so what I've done in this project is I've taken a guide called California Plants as Resources for Lepidopter by Jeffrey Caldwell. And this is uh, a statewide interaction data set detailing the interactions between butterflies and moths and their native hosts and nectar plants across the entire state of California. We have around 2000 Lepidopter species 2,000 native plant species and 14,000 unique interactions detailed in this data set. And I've funneled all of that data into a web application that I've developed called the Butterfly Net. And this app is intended to help people find the best native hosts and nectar plants for butterflies and moths anywhere where you live in California. And it is a web application. There's a QR code here, which will bring you to the address, but it doesn't really work great on a phone, just a warning. So when you use this app, what you're gonna see is the first thing you're gonna do is input your address. Um, so you can click on your location on the map or you can type in your address. And then you're gonna hit the find plants button. First thing it's gonna show you is which eco region you are a part of. And I'm gonna go through what an eco region is in a second. It's gonna give you the options of selecting a local natural habitat type that you may want to emulate in whatever habitat project you're planting. So maybe you wanna you want to plant a community that resembles a native annual grassland. So you can choose that. And there's gonna be um, at least a list of five local habitat types that you can choose from. And then you can also choose to focus on just host plants, just nectar plants or both, and then just butterflies, just moths, or both as well. And it's gonna spit out a list of your priority plant species in that area. I'm gonna go through how these are ranked throughout the rest of this talk, and also the, the weird blue highlights as well. But this is gonna be a list of the best hosts and nectar plants in your area for Lepidoptera that occur around you. It's also gonna show you visualizations of your local interaction networks. Um, so they're going to look like this, but really what they are are your caterpillar host plant network for your area and your adult nectar plant network for your area. So these are going to be the interactions between plants and insects at two different life stages here. And through analyzing this whole data set, I've arrived at three important considerations to protect entire communities of threatened Lepidoptera in California. Number one, we have to plant native hosts and nectar plants. Number two, we have to prioritize the most important plant species. And number three, we have to consider geographic variation in species and interactions. I'm gonna go through each one of these points. Starting with number one, the importance of planting native hosts and nectar plants. So we see a lot of emphasis on things like pollinator gardens or butterfly gardens, which oftentimes focus on providing those showy floral resources for our adult butterflies and bees and other pollinators. On the other side of the spectrum, as in monarch conservation, there's a focus on planting just the host plant, the milkweed. But again, remember that Lepidopter rely on native plant resources at each stage of their life cycle. And there's actually been some interesting research showing that the loss of monarch nectar plants could contribute more to their decline than the loss of milkweed. So maybe we're focusing on the wrong plants here. But really what this is showing us is that conservation efforts have to consider resource dependencies at each life stage. And we can do that using the, this data set that I have here. And what I've found by analyzing this data is that Caterpillars are more specialized than adults. And so in our caterpillar host plant network, there's an average of about 3.6 host plants per caterpillar species. Whereas in our nectar plant network, we have an average of 14.7 nectar plants per, per species. And ultimately what this means is that caterpillars are more sensitive to plant extinctions than adults. And so what we've done is perform simulated extinctions um, where we remove a plant from the network and we analyze which Lepidopter species may go extinct because of that loss. And this could be simulating the local loss of species in an area like Griffith Park, or it could be simulating the actual extinction of that plant 
And we found that in the caterpillar host plant network, it only takes an, on average 1.4 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct. Whereas in the nectar plant network, it takes an average of 6.25 plant extinctions to drive one insect extinct. So what this is telling us here is that the caterpillars are much more sensitive to plant species loss. And again, this is putting the emphasis on the fact that a lot of Lepidopter are host plant specialists like the monarch butterfly. And in fact, I found that 43% of Lepidopter species in California have just one host plant and a full 73% have three or fewer. So this is telling us that caterpillars are picky eaters. So we have to be picky in choosing which host plants to provide them. We need to be finding those particular species and planting them to ultimately support these caterpillars and allow them to complete their life cycle. But a really important part of this is that Lepidopter actually use discrete hosts and nectar plants. So what that means is that the caterpillars are often using a different subset of the plants as host plants in our plant communities than the adults are using as nectar plants. And this was statistically significant across the entire state of California. So we can be planting all of the host plants that we want and not really be providing much of the necessary nectar plants and vice versa. We can plant all the nectar plants that we want for our adults and not really be providing those host plants. So again, where we, we see a lot of emphasis on, on planting just host plants or just nectar plants, effective lepidopter conservation must include protecting both those hosts and nectar plants, like this sign from the UCR Botanic Garden emphasizes. And it comes down to this idea, without the caterpillar, you don't get the butterfly or the moth, and vice versa. Without supporting our adult Lepidoptera, we're not going to get future generations of caterpillars. All right, so concluding this first part here, while we saw that the caterpillar stage is more specialized and more vulnerable to plant species loss, we also saw that Lepidopter used discrete hosts and nectar plants, emphasizing the importance of planting both to support the entire Lepidopter life cycle. All right, so coming down to point number two here, prioritizing the most important plant species. California is a biodiversity hotspot. There are over 6,500 native or endemic plant species in the California floristic province. And of those, we have around 2,000 of them um, represented in this data set as known Lepidoptera hosts and nectar plants. So I really doubt any of us are gonna be planting 2,000 plants in our yards or gardens. And so we have some prioritizing to do here. So how do we prioritize these species? Well, the way that I've approached prioritizing plant species is coming back to a old but really important concept in ecology called the keystone species concept. And keystone species are just those species in our communities that are disproportionately important to the rest of the system. Um, the namesake is the, the, keystone, the keystone in the Roman arch, uh, which keeps the rest of the arch from collapsing. And I found that in California, few keystone plant species support the majority of Lepidopter species. What I mean by that here is when we take all of our plants, just 32% of our host plants support 90% of all Lepidopter species in the state, and just 9% of our nectar plants support 90% of Lepidopter species. So these, these small percentage of our plant communities are those most important plant species, our keystone species. But we can take this a step further with ecological network analysis by analyzing what's called network modularity. And this is just the tendency of groups of species within these ecological networks to form compartments of more closely interacting species. So on the right here, we have our whole interaction network with the shaded regions being these modules of more closely interacting species. And two important roles have been established here are, mo are module hubs, which are species which are highly connected within their own modules. So we have those in the red here. And then we have our module connectors, which are in the blue here. And those are species that help connect different modules and maintain cohesion of the network. 
And studies have shown that the loss of these module hubs and connectors leads to cascading extinctions across networks. So that means when you lose these species, you're gonna lose a lot of other species as a result. So these are really important species in maintaining the stability of the network overall. So when you see these priority plant species lists on the app, this is how they're calculated using this modularity analysis. So species that are higher up on the list are gonna be those species that are more important to, for maintaining that stability in the entire community. And I do wanna point out that this ranking method does not necessarily sacrifice our rare or threatened species like the monarch butterfly. You'll often find, so the highlights here means that, the blue highlights means that this species uh, supports a threatened or endangered Lepidopter species in California. And so you'll often see in that uh, milkweed plants, uh, species in the genus Asclepius are, are high up on these lists. And that's because although we know milkweed as the monarch plant, milkweed actually hosts four different Lepidopter species in the state, including one of my favorites here, the Cleo tiger moth. And it provides nectar for 104 Lepidopter species across the state. So in particular, it's a really, really important genus as a, uh, for nectar. All right, so concluding this section, we found that few keystone plant species support the majority of Lepidopter species. And we've also found that community level plant ranking does not necessarily sacrifice our rare or threatened species. So we can have both providing that support to the entire network while also supporting our rare threatened species. All right, coming down to our last point here, the importance of considering geographic variation in species and interactions. So we all know that California is a huge and very diverse state. And what that means is that we have a diversity of habitats, a diversity of species, and a diversity of interactions. And all of these things can vary with things like latitude and elevation and distance from coast. So I'm gonna come back to the monarch again as a good example of this. There are actually around 15 different native milkweed species scattered across the state, each having a slightly different range like you can see here in these colors. And we know that planting local milkweed varieties is really important because if you don't do that, you actually risk confusing monarch migration patterns and increasing the risk of harmful parasites. So extending the same idea to the community level, I've taken our California ecoregions. And ecoregions are just areas throughout the state that have similar climatic conditions and similar habitat types. And wherever you reside in any of these ecoregions, there's going to be a variety of different natural habitat types that occur around you. So I gave this talk at the CMPS conference in San Jose. So this is where the example is from. San Jose, we have everything from mixed chaparral to different types of grasslands. And across those habitat types, you're gonna have plant and Lepidopter species that occur there. Um, some of them are gonna be restricted to individual habitats. Some of them are gonna occur across many different habitat types. So what I've done is I've layered these species occurrences on top of our habitats and ecoregions in order to be able to determine exactly what species are interacting in any given habitat type in any given ecoregion. So we're extracting these local interaction networks just comprised of those species that are occurring and interacting around you. And so just like it's important to plant local varieties of milkweed, it's important to pay attention to the local interaction networks because actually what I found here is that the identity of those keystone plant species varies significantly between our California ecoregions. And this makes a lot of sense when we zoom in on how individual species vary across the landscape. So on the X axis here, I have plotted our California ecoregions roughly from north to south. And then on our Y axis, we have um, a metric that I call plant importance. And this is calculated from that modularity analysis. And it just ranges from zero to one, one being more important. And so I'm gonna plant individual species on this plot here. And what we see here is that, so the first example is Yarrow, Achillea millifolium. 
And we see that it does vary significantly in how important it is across the state. We see it kind of peaks in importance in the middle part of its range near the central basin. And when I put more plants on here, so here we have our narrow leaf milkweed that has a slightly different pattern. It gets more important in the southern end of its range. But we're also seeing here that not only do these plant species vary in how important they are across the state, they also vary in relation to one another to how important they are as hosts and nectar plants for Lepidoptera. So here we have chemise, and then finally we have California mugwort. So you can see that yarrow is consistently up there near the top, pretty important throughout its entire range, whereas California mugwort is a great plant for other, other purposes, but it's not the best host or nectar plant for Lepidoptera. All right, so concluding this last section here, we saw that the identity of the keystone plant species varies significantly between California ecoregions and habitats. And then we also found that the importance of individual plant species for Lepidoptera varies significantly throughout the landscape. <laughs> All right, so you, you may still be wondering after seeing this, which plant species should I plant? Well, really the answer is use the app because um, finding those local species that are really important in your area requires understanding the local interaction network in the habitat types that you're trying to emulate. I'm gonna go through what I mean by that here. So again, the app is gonna, allow you to pick your precise location um, and also provide you these options on what you want to focus on, host plants, nectar plants, maybe you want to plant a moth uh, host plant garden so you can find the plants that are best for that. Um, so again, looking at our ecoregions, if we just zoom in on Southern California where we are right now, we have a lot of of different ecoregions that occurred just here in Southern California. We have the Southern California mountains, we have um, the Southern California slash Northern Baja coast, which is where we are right now. We have the Mojave, parts of the Mojave Basin and Range, and then we have parts of the Sonoran Basin and Range as well. So there's already a lot going on, but I'm just going to zoom into the ecoregion that we are in right now, the Southern California coast. Just in this ecoregion alone, we have 18 different natural habitat types. So this is a very busy figure showing all of those habitat types and how they're spread out, for, uh, spread out across this region. So again, it's really important to pay attention to where you live, what your local habitat type looks like, what ecoregion you're in. <clears throat> but with that being said, there are some good examples of plants that are pretty good pretty much anywhere. Um, and so I, I condensed all this data and found the plants that are um, pretty much going to be good across Southern California. Keep in mind that this is using a summary of all this data. So some of these plants are maybe just going to be suitable for mount, more mountainous regions or more deserty regions. Um, so let's look at some of the best butterfly nectar plants for Southern California. At the top of our list, we have uh, bitter dog bait. So a lot of these plants may be ones that are not used in um, you know, horticultural or landscaping context very often, but maybe it'll give you some ideas. Um, a great butterfly nectar plant. Here we have some pygmy blues visiting it. Uh, common yarrow. Yarrow is consistently at the top of these lists. It's one of the best butterfly plants you can plant. And here we have a variable checker spot. Salt heliotrope is another one. I didn't even know what this was until I saw this data set. It's a really interesting little plant. And here we have a gray hair streak visiting it. And again, coming back to the idea here that we can also support our rare and threatened species. So um, on our list here is California buckwheat, super common plant, very good butterfly nectar plant, but it's also the ne a nectar plant for the threatened Hermes copper. So if you live in uh, kind of east of San Diego and part of its range, maybe you can plant this and provide some resources for the Hermes copper. And then at the bottom of our list here, um, so this is just the top 10. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, also wanted to point out that desert lavender 
is a nectar plant for the endangered Kino checker spot butterfly. Um, so where I live in Riverside, this is a species of high conservation value right now. All right, so let's switch over to butterfly host plants. Um, we have deerweed, very common plant again, but a super good butterfly host plant, including for the venereal dusky wing. We have California buckwheat again, um, and here we have bear's metalmark butterfly hosting on that. And then in this picture here on naked buckwheat, you may not even see the butterfly, but actually it's up here in the corner here. It's a little slug looking butterfly, blends in very well to that plant. And then we have chemise here, which is also a nectar plant for the threatened Hermes copper. So again, we're including some of these plants that are important for our endangered species. All right, let's switch on over to moths. A lot of people don't really plant for moths, but moths, again, I hope I've showed you are important too. And so we have rubber rabbit brush, which is a really good nectar plant for moths, including the white line sphinx. Again, we have the white line sphinx in this uh, picture. Black sage is a really good nectar plant for moths. This actually is not black sage, but I could not find a picture of a moth visiting black sage. And then we have uh, yarrow, again, not just good for butterflies, also really good for moths. So here we have the yarrow plume moth, um, a really interesting looking moth. It's kind of like a, like a T shape. Um, and it is, yarrow is both its host plant and the nectar plant for this species. All right, let's switch on over to moth host plants. So at the top of our list, we have Western choke cherry, and here's a hawk moth, um, uh, the small-eyed sphinx that's hosting on this species. And then we have snowberry, which is um, also a host to several different hawk moth species in California, including the California clear wing, which is a really cool day flying moth, which with clear wings. All right, this is another camouflage guy. We have the wavy lined emerald or otherwise known as a camouflage looper on California buckwheat. Um, this one, I confess, I couldn't even find it in the picture. Um, it turns out that this moth species glues on parts of the petals of, of California buckwheat on its body to camouflage on the petals of that plant. So here's a better picture where you can actually see that caterpillar without the petals on its body. Um, but even the coloration is a, a pretty good match to California buckwheat. And again, we have an endangered species that uses uh, our sea cliff buckwheat. <clears throat> if you live anywhere around here, you may be familiar with the endangered El Segundo blue, one of the rarest butterflies in the country. Um, and it uses the sea cliff buckwheat as a host plant. Um, Unfortunately, unless you happen to live right on the El Segundo dunes, which you're not allowed to, so I know no one does, you're probably not going to be able to provide uh, resources for this butterfly. All right, so that's kind of the end of my talk, but before I get into questions, I wanted to revisit our friend the monarch butterfly one last time. At the beginning of this talk, I told you that in 2020, the Western population had suffered an over 99% decline in its population. Well, the good news is that thanks in part to milkweed planting efforts in 2021, the Western monarch uh, population rebounded over a hundredfold with uh, over 200,000 individuals counted. Um, and so this is really good news and it really speaks to the fact that, you know, this kind of stuff works. Planting native plants really can make a difference. But I hope I've showed you here today that it's not just the monarch butterfly that's at risk. And with tools like mine, we can all start planting the best hosts and nectar plants for butterflies and moths to support entire communities in California. And that is it. Uh, one last note, the butterfly net is a work in progress. And so I welcome comments, suggestions. If you see errors, I know we have a lot of plant experts experts out here. If you see a plant that does not belong in your area, please point it out. You can email me or you can also use the links on the website to report those.
And with that, I'd like, I'd like to thank everyone who's helped me on this project, including um, my lab members, my uh, partner, Annika, who's in the audience. Um, and uh, for the data, Jeffrey Caldwell, I could not have done this without this data set. Um, thanks to CMPS and Calscape, who I've been collaborating with to integrate this into their online systems, and all of my wonderful undergraduates who have helped me along the way. And thank you, and I can take any questions. Um, I've um, always been under the impression that when you are trying to plant um, and provide habitat for um, butterflies and now moths, that you should plant a, several of an individual species and not just one in order to maximize you know, the, the available food source. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, so I think, first of all, I would say that if you have the space for it, more is usually better when it comes to planting native plants. Um, but also, you know, the way natural communities work is diversity is usually really good. So instead of planting all of one species, I would recommend maybe planting a mixture of maybe some butterfly host plants and also some nectar plants, um, you know, mix it up a little bit. In terms of you know, if you're trying to attract and support a particular species, you know, butterflies and moths uh, use visual cues to find the plants that they need. And so they have shown that larger plantings will actually increase more. Um, they've studied that a lot with the monarch butterfly. It's actually as complicated as how they plant the milkweed among different species of plants. Um, but Generally, yes, if, if you're trying to, for example, support the monarch butterfly, maybe one plant is not the way to go. Try to plant a, at least a decent sized patch of it if you have the space. But, you know, if you don't have the space, even a single individual plant, like my measly plant that I had in, in a pot on my balcony did good. It attracted some and supported some, some Lepidoptera. Okay, yeah, I can take this. Um, so one online question we have is, could you possibly speak to the question of what types of milkweed might be harmful to the monarchs? So yeah, uh, with the caveat that I am not a butterfly expert, <laughs> what I do know about the monarch butterfly is that um, tropical milkweed is really, really bad. So um, I would definitely recommend not planting tropical milkweed. Um, number one, I don't know what's causing that, I'm not moving. <laughs> um, so tropical milkweed actually increases the prevalence of a really bad parasite for the monarch butterfly. Um, I'm blanking on its name. It's some long scientific name. Um, so that's really bad. But also, again, like I mentioned in my talk, even planting a native species that isn't native to your part of California can potentially confuse their migration patterns. And the reason is because, again, monarchs are visual. They use the cues in their environment, including what's in bloom at what time, to kind of tell them, okay, this is what I should be doing right now. Should I be laying eggs? Should I be migrating? Um, and when you have species that are in bloom in the wrong time of year in your area, it's going to confuse those visual cues for them. And they're going to think that they should be in a different stage of their life cycle or starting the migration when they shouldn't start it um, and stuff like that. So generally, definitely do not plant non-native milkweed, but try to find those milkweed species that are native to your specific area in California. And there's a lot of resources online for you to be able to do that. Thanks, Chris. I, I thought it was interesting that the you pointed out that the specialists typically have, they, they distinguish between their, their host plant and their nectar plant. Do you attribute that to something? Is that some kind of evolutionary uh, survival strategy perhaps? That, developed? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question, one that I've, I've thought about and failed to answer. So um, there, there's been some studies, you know, hypothesizing why it may be. Uh, the idea you mentioned, like why a certain species may use a plant as a host plant, but not as a nectar plant, it may have something to do with 
the fact that one of those interaction types is antagonistic herbivory. The plant doesn't really want to be attracting those herbivores evolutionarily. Um, whereas the other interaction type is a mutualistic interaction. So pollination um, leads to reproduction in the plant. Um, so it could be something to do with that. I, I think someone needs to study that and I haven't really seen a good answer yet, but definitely an interesting one. Uh, just thank you so much for your work and really mind blowing thinking about how you did this. And it seems like it's so much work. Um, but my question is, if you could just speak to the difference between your app and say like Calscape as a resource, because I was surprised when I looked on the butterfly net and looked at my zip code and saw like the list of plants and like only one butterfly species for say an oak, whereas on Calscape there would be like 200 different species. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. And I've actually, like I mentioned here at the end, I've been working with people from Calscape and CMPS to sort of, first of all, understand why there are those sorts of differences between our data sets. Um, one of them is that Calscape uses a slightly different, we'll call it an algorithm for where they determine which species are using that plant. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not gonna say that one is better or the other, we're, we're still trying to figure it out um, and actually combine our data in a way that makes the most sense. Um, but I will say that with my data set, there definitely are some issues. One of those is the fact that the way I've created this, it relies on, for example, plant taxonomic names to line up. And if you know plant taxonomy, you know that it's constantly changing. So. Um, if in one of the data sets the plant is called by a different name, the way it works right now, it doesn't always line up. So certainly in your area, if you know of a plant that should be in there or know of a butterfly or moth that should be in there, it, that could definitely be the case. It could be missing. Um, and that's just a limitation of the data as we have it right now. So we're trying to improve that. Um, the other thing I'll say is that the way I have it is a little bit more specific than how Calscape does it. So I've separated it, not just by broad ecoregion, but by specific habitat type. And so what that relies on is for that butterfly or moth um, and that plant that it uses as a resource to have been observed in that specific habitat type at some point. So sometimes also this could be the fact that even though that butterfly uses this as a host plant somewhere else, it may not do that in that specific area. And that's something that we're beginning to learn more about um, is that, you know, not only do species vary in their geographic ranges, but interactions can actually vary tremendously in where and when they occur. And a lot of times we don't really know why, but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of complexity and, and part of the, Part of the like excitement about big data sets like this is that we can start drawing from all different resources, including iNaturalist. I've used iNaturalist observations in, in creating this data set. So citizen science is helping to improve the resolution and the confidence in the results that we're getting. Okay, another one from online asks, are butterflies or moths primarily attracted to fragrance, color shape, arrangement, or structure of flowers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so butterflies are very visual, so they'll respond a lot to color um, and size of flowers because they're out during the day. Um, now moths have evolved in the nighttime environment, so visual visualization is not as much of a thing. Um, so they rely very heavily on scent. Um, so a lot of a lot of like stereotypically moth pollinated plants are going to be very heavily scented, and often also white because whiter color flowers, white flowers are more visible in in the nighttime environment. So that helps them uh, locate them. But it is species specific. So you know some moths are really good at smelling. Um, you know, they've also co-evolved with bats, so a lot of them are really good at hearing, so it kind of just depends on the species. Are there any other questions in the audience? Perfect. Okay.